to Hebrews chapter 12 with me. Hebrews chapter 12. And let me read, starting in verse 18. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, and we read this. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, once again we thank you and praise you for the joy of our fellowship with you and with each other. The opportunity that you've given us, the privilege and blessing to gather together Lord, to worship you in our fellowship with each other, to worship you in our, our song sung to your honor, your glory, to worship you in prayer, coming to you, Lord God, because you are, are all in all. You are the one, the only uh, God and Savior who has all we need and has given us all we need in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we thank you and praise you that we can come in prayer. And Lord, to worship you in giving. And Lord, to worship you in giving you our heart, our life, for your honor, your glory. And so for that, we pause and we pray and ask that you would take your word now and cause us, unlike Saul, to be those that are ready and willing and yielded to obey you, to your word, to submit to you and your word. So, Father, teach us, we pray. Uh, Lord, open our heart's eyes to see truth uh, from your word that we need to know, to hear, to understand. And, Lord, I pray for that because perhaps there are some here today that need convicted of the need that they've never truly repented and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. Lord, bring them to that place today, we pray. And Father, we pray because perhaps today we, we need you to encourage and strengthen the faith of some. Lord, as, as Jeffrey said at the outset, who are struggling and facing difficulties and discouragements. Lord, may the truth of your gospel, the truth of Christ, encourage and strengthen and motivate, uh, Lord, us to love you and serve you by loving and ministering to others. And Father, again, we just thank you that we can gather together to a God that knows absolutely every need of our heart. And so we pray and ask, O oh God, that you would speak your truth to our hearts today and cause us, Lord, to yield in absolute obedience and may you be glorified. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. As the writer of Hebrews is winding this epistle down, especially in terms of practical application, he brings what I think to be the overall message of Hebrews down to an illustration. An illustration of two mountains 
Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And, and this is really the last comparison that the writer of, he the last of many comparisons that the writer of Hebrews is going to make between the old covenant and the new covenant. Between law and grace. Between works and faith in the finished work of Christ. And he's bringing it down to this illustration of two mountains. Now, I have no idea what the book, The Tale of Two Cities, is about. So don't quote me on that. But this is the tale of two mountains. And it's not even the tale of two mountains. It's the reality of two mountains. One Mount Sinai in Arabia, where God came down and gave his law. And the people trembled. And it was Sinai where the law of sin and death was proclaimed. And the people should have trembled. But there's another mountain. Mount Zion. Which came to be not only the city of Jerusalem, but ultimately representative of the new covenant and the promise of life by faith in Christ who came to Jerusalem and lived and died and rose again that the new covenant could be fulfilled and ultimately Zion came to picture heaven itself the very throne room of God and folks the big question is this which mountain are you climbing to try to get to heaven? Which one? Because from the very early days, there are those that are still trying to climb Sinai and the law of God and their own works righteousness to get to heaven. And the writer of Hebrews is going to teach us clearly that that leads only to sin and death and hell. But there's another mountain. And that's Mount Zion. The new covenant of the grace of God that saves based on the finished work of Christ. And my friend, the greatest question in your life and mine is which mountain are you climbing to try to get to heaven? And so we want to look at this. Uh, because in the day and age, uh, the first century, when the writer of Hebrews was writing this, that was the problem. There were many of the Jews that were still turning back to the Old Testament law and works. And we've read that many times in Romans 10, where Israel had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Because being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they sought to establish their own righteousness by the law. And Paul's heart broke. And the writer of Hebrews, writing to that first century crowd, said, listen, you have got to repent and turn from your, your sinful, self-righteous works and turn to Christ. But folks, the same message is applicable today. Because guess what? Our churches are full of religious people trying to climb Mount Sinai to get to heaven. And they need to know, they need to get off that mountain and climb Zion where there is absolute forgiveness and salvation. And so look at it with me. Uh, we got a long way to go here. I, I hope we can get through all this. I fully intend to. I hope to. But it is a good thing that you are not come to Mount Zion, the old covenant, the law of sin and death. Why? Because there's no salvation on Mount Sinai. Do you believe that today? There is no salvation on Mount Sinai. In verses 18 to 21, the writer of Hebrews tells us why. Number one, because if you come to Sinai, you come to a mountain you cannot climb. Look at, at verse 18. He says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched. 
he's referring to Sinai. The, the, the Mount Sinai is a reference to the literal physical mountain in Arabia where Moses led the children to after they were released from Egypt. And you read about that in Exodus 19 and 20 and Deuteronomy 4 and 5. And I would encourage you sometime, maybe this afternoon, to sit down and read that. Because three months after being released from Egypt, Israel came and camped by the mount, Mount Sinai. And there God gave them the law, the Ten Commandments. And there they, they camped at the foot of a mountain where God said, set a bound. So that nothing touches the mountain. Because if anything touches that mountain, what was true? It was to die. You say, well, what about Moses? That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because God called Moses to come up. And God made provision and protection for Moses. But anything that sought to approach God on Mount Sinai in and of themselves were to die. But not only were they to die, if they touched it, you weren't even to touch them. God said, if some beast touches that mountain, don't you go up and pull it down. You need to kill it, and you need to either kill it with stones or an arrow or a spear, some interpret. Why? Because you're not even to touch what touched the mountain of God. Folks, I don't think we comprehend God's holiness. Because a sinner can't touch God's holiness in and of ourselves and, and stand. And that's the picture here. Now, I will tell you this is a challenging phrase because I think it could mean one of two things. When, when he says, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, either you have not come to the physical, literal mountain which can be touched. And that, that's true. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, you've not come to the physical Mount Sinai that can be touched. Uh, as, as in Mount Sinai, the earthly physical representation of the heavenly dwelling place of God. Because that physical mountain falls far short of the actual dwelling place of God in heaven. And he says you've not come to that mountain that can be touched. Which, which really serves only as a, a shadow, a representative. And by the way, the writer of Hebrews points to many of the physical earthly shadows that represent the true and the real in heaven. And that could be what he means by this. But there's another thought. Is it possible that when he says you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that he's talking about Mount Sinai as a mountain that, that you cannot touch without dying? If you, if you so much as touch this, you wouldn't live. Go back to Exodus 19 and let's look at a little bit of this. Um, and I'll just tell you, I don't, I don't know which one's in view here. And, and I'm not going to be dogmatic about either one. But when he says you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, is he saying you, you've come to a mountain that you can't touch and live? And why do I say that? In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 12, it says, uh, The Lord speaking to Moses said, You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him. But he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether a man or a beast. He shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, you shall come near the mountain. But then jump down to verse 20. Jump down to Exodus 19 and verse 20 to 24. And there we read this. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. Now stop and get this picture. Moses is down. God says, come up. So he goes up. And look at what he says. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people. I mean, I, I can, I, he gets to the top. Now, Moses, go down and warn the people. And he's like, really? 
Go down and warn the people, 21, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also the priests who come near the Lord consecrate them, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to, the Mount, to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. What's the next verse? Moses, get going. Why? Because if one of them so much as touches this mountain, they'll die. My friend, God is serious about his holiness. And I'll tell you what, if you want to go to God by way of Mount Sinai and the Old Testament law, that's the mountain, and you can't touch it. You can't touch it apart from Christ. Amen? And God went to great lengths to demonstrate that. Which one of those is it? I don't know. But at any rate, Mount Sinai is not a mountain that you have come to in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Because if you don't come through Christ, you have no hope of ever reaching God. No hope. There's a second thing I want you to see here as to why we ought to be glad that we are not coming by way of Sinai. And that is this. Because if you come to Sinai, you come face to face with the all-consuming reality of God's all-consuming holy presence before whose presence you have no hope. Look at verse 18, the second part. He says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest. The very presence of God, as God descended onto Mount Sinai, was covered by three things. What are they? All-consuming fire. God had to descend in fire. Why? Because his blazing glory couldn't be seen or man couldn't have even lived. And so it was covered, as it were, in all-consuming fire. How many times does Scripture remind us But our God is an all-consuming fire? And yet still people try to reach him based on their righteousness. Folks, that's, a, that's an arrogant, scary thought. Amen? He is an all-consuming fire. He, he, the, the mountain was covered by an impenetrable cloud of thick, black darkness. Again, the terms are, are piled on top of each other. It's thick. It's impenetrable. It's black. It's darkness. And, and, and the one term, actually two of the terms, even gives the idea of gloominess. You can't find your way through it. It's darkness. And then lastly, tempest. Stormy tempest. Blowing stormy tempest as in a hurricane. Folks, the idea is when they looked on that mountain, they saw the fact that no one has any hope of coming into God's presence and remaining and standing. No hope at all. Why? Because our God is an all-consuming fire, and he is surrounded by a, a shroud of cloud that we can never make our way through, and a storm blowing that you and I could never stand before in and of ourselves. No one can stand before God in our sinfulness and based on our own righteousness. And God wants people to understand that. Nahum, the prophet Nahum, described it in these terms. In Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 to 6, we read this. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. 
The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Basham and Carmel wither, and the flowers of Lebanon wilt. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? What's the answer to that question? No one. And who can endure his, the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Folks, we need to understand that that is true of our God, or we'll never understand our need of Jesus. Because if we think for a moment that we can approach God... We've failed to see and understand that God is the God of the fire and the darkness and the storm of Mount Sinai. Aren't you glad you don't have to come to God by way of Sinai? That's what he's saying. Folks, do you get that? We ought to rejoice that we don't have to come by way of Sinai. Um, that sight, that presence of God caused trembling. And again, the message is clear. No one could approach our holy God on Mount Sinai based on the old covenant law and ever stand. But that's not the mountain we have come to. There's a third thing. We should be glad that we've not come to Sinai. Why? Because if we come to Mount Sinai, you cannot endure the sound of his commandments. Look at verse 19 and 20 again. In the sound of a, a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. Why? Why did they beg that this word should not be spoken to them anymore? Verse 20. Because they could not endure what was commanded. I'm not going to take the time to look at it, but if you go back earlier in Exodus 19, and God said to Israel, if you keep my covenant, you'll be a special people. Do you remember what Israel said? Oh, we'll keep everything you say, Lord. Just tell us. And God said, okay, here's just 10 things. Let's see how that goes. How did that go in reality? How'd they do? They all failed. But yet, do you know what many of them continued to try to do? They continued to try to earn God's favor by keeping those 10 commandments and secure a place in heaven by their own righteousness. Instead of seeing their sinfulness and repenting and seeing their need of a Savior and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at it. It, it says the sound of trumpet. It, God, God had, along with his voice, this sound of a trumpet that grew louder and louder. That, that caused even Moses to tremble. And, and, and we, we read about that in Exodus, and we'll look at it here in a moment. But it was so fierce that they heard, those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Imagine that. Imagine saying, I don't want to hear God's word anymore. And yet that's what they were doing. Why? Because God's word at Sinai was, keep these Ten Commandments and you'll be my special people. Break any one of these Ten Commandments and you're cursed. What's that make you think? Folks, if that doesn't make us think, there is no hope for me, 
apart from a gracious deliverance by God, we're not listening to the law. Amen? And yet still today, if we went out and we knocked on ten doors of people that would talk to us and say, do you have to keep the Ten Commandments in order to get your way into heaven? I wonder how many of those ten people would say, yeah, yeah. And I wonder how many of those ten people would say, no, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who kept them for me and forgives me of all of my sin and gives me his righteousness in which I am acceptable to God in the beloved one and I want to live and serve him with my life. You see, one Sinai, one Zion. And again, we need, to, we need to see it. We need to understand it. Let's look at it again in Exodus. Look at Exodus 19, verse 16. I just, I just want us to see this in this, this Old Testament text. Exodus 19 and verse 16, we read this. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thundering and thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai and upon the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Again, uh, look down at chapter 20 and verse 18. Because between that point and, and Ex or, yeah, Exodus 20, God gave the Ten Commandments. And he finishes up in giving the Ten Commandments in chapter 20 and verse 17. And then we read this. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, flashes, and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they, what? They trembled and they stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear but let not God speak with us, lest we die. Now what was it about what God had just said that made them tremble? Ten commandments. That they knew in their heart, I cannot endure it. Question, do you understand that same truth? Or are you still trying to climb Sinai? Folks, the message of Sinai is a message of bondage to sin and death and hell. And it was meant to be a schoolmaster to cause us to run to Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? They begged... They begged that the word should no longer be spoken to them anymore. Why? Because they could not endure what was commanded. What was commanded. Thus they feared the word of the Lord because they knew they fell short. And again, my friend, we need to understand that no one has hope of ever standing before God on Sinai. But in Christ, we are made complete. And I'm not going to take the time to read it, but I, I, Romans chapter 3 tells us that the righteousness through faith in Christ is revealed. The law causes us to be silent and be found guilty. We have to read it. Look at Romans 3 with me, please. Look at Romans 3, please. And I know we've, we've read this so many times. I, I was reading or listening this week to somebody that said, you know, even Christians who have heard this stuff over and over and over again, 
if we hear it again, it ought to thrill our hearts. It shouldn't be, oh boy, we're reading that again. It ought to thrill our hearts. Look at Romans 3.19. Romans 3.19, the Apostle Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, why? So that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Do you know what ought to happen when we read the law? We ought to go, I am so guilty. I need a Savior. His name's Jesus. That's what, that's what Sinai says. Verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what Sinai does. It tells you you're guilty. You're a sinner. You cannot stand. And yet people are still trying to climb Sinai to get to heaven. But verse 21, but now the righteousness of God, what righteousness? Of God apart from the law, has been revealed even the righteousness of God, which is what? Through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. My friend, there's no salvation at Sinai. But in Christ, there's complete salvation. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, he said, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. And yet there's still people trying to climb Sinai. Brad Mabin, Wednesday night in prayer meeting, took us to Galatians chapter 4 where the two covenants are seen and, and Isaac and Ishmael. And at the end of that text it says, are you listening to the law? Are you listening to the law? Many people really aren't hearing the law. Amen? Amen. Folks, we've got the good news to share with them. We've got the good news. But you know what? That good news is only good news if you understand this blackness and darkness and storm and consuming fire. And that's why God gave it. That's why God gave it. So if you want to come to God at Sinai, then you need to come with all ten commandments perfectly kept or else you're under the curse Again, Paul said in Galatians 4.21, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? There's a fourth thing that we need to see at Sinai. And we ought to be so grateful that we don't come to God by way of Sinai in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant law and works. Why? Because the Old Testament law results in death for everyone that touches it. And, and again, we already alluded to it in verse 20. But if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow. In light of the fact that we all fall short of God's glory, anyone who touches the holy standard of God in and of ourselves shall surely die. Um, there's another thing I want you to see in verse 21. We need to be grateful that we don't come to God by way of Zion because no one is exempt from such a fearful standing before God. Look at verse 21. It says, And so terrifying was the sight that who? That even Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now I understand there's a textual variant there and some think that is or isn't part of the text. 
You're going to have to talk to the Lord about that someday. But I believe that Moses trembled because he understood who God really was. But I believe that Moses celebrated when that same God said to Moses, come, come talk to me face to face as a friend speaks with a friend. But folks, do you know the only way we will really rejoice at that? That God would call a sinner like me into his presence? As if I've first seen the all-consuming fire and the blackness of the darkness and the gloom and the hopelessness and the storm. And again, I, I think that's so vital because we live in a day and an age in which there's a gospel preached as though God owes us something. Folks, if we got what was just and right from God, we would all have hell long ago. Amen? But oh, that he would save a sinner like me. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Exceedingly afraid and trembling. You know, Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Let me just read a couple. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Do you know why many people in our world don't have right understanding? Because they don't have a knowledge of the Holy One. We, we have brought God down to some human level. And we've missed the all-consuming fire and gloomy darkness and storm. And yet a knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and your years of your life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. There are many people scoffing at the Holy One. And someday they'll bear it. But folks, what's even scarier is there's some religious people that are trying to climb Zion to get to that holy one. And they'll bear it. They'll bear it. Even Moses was touched by that. And yet Exodus 33 tells us that Moses was he who the Lord spoke to face to face as a friend speaks with his friend. Can I have you look at one verse in John 15, 15? You say, well, that, that was Moses. Moses, he had this, this special relationship with God. Yeah, he, he did have an incredible relationship with God. But look at what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 15. Those that come to God in Christ by faith enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ that is amazing. Because in John 15, 15, Jesus said this, No longer do I call you servants. Why not, Lord? For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you... What? What? Friends, but I have called you friends. That same God who is an all-consuming fire shrouded in darkness and stormy tempests says to you and I, come, come, come. 
and I will forgive you of every sin, and I will give you the righteousness of God through faith, and I will adopt you into my family, and I will even make you heirs of God and join heirs with Christ Jesus who will be your friend. Folks, get off Sinai and run to Zion. Amen? Wow. We need to understand and make no mistake that Mount Sinai, the Old Covenant, the works of the law lead only to sin and death and judgment before God. Amen? But there's another mountain. And I don't have time to get to it. I don't have time to get to it. But I want you to look back at Romans chapter 8 with me. And with this, we're going to close today. Because I don't want to rush through this. Romans 8 and verse 1. Paul very clearly says this. There is therefore now, what? No condemnation to who? To those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh. Do you know what that walk according to the flesh means? They walk according to the fleshly ordinances. They walk trying to keep the works of the law. They walk trying to in their outward religiosity, please God. How many people do you know like that? Friends, relatives, neighbors? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Why? Look at the next verse. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. All those people that walk according to the flesh, trying to earn God's favor with the outward works of, of the law, are still trying to climb Sinai and get to God. And Paul says, the law can't do that. You'll never make it. There's a consuming fire waiting for you. There, there's thick black darkness and a stormy tempest that will blow you away. But there's another mountain. And that's the new covenant in the blood of Christ. The Lamb of God that what? Takes away the sins of the world. And Lord willing, next time we'll look at that. But, but my friend, my question to you today is this. And, and this was the message that the writer of Hebrews was going after in his day and age. And folks, I would submit to you it is a message that this big valley needs to hear. There's nothing at the top of Sinai and the old covenant of works that will get you to heaven. Do you believe that? And have you come to that realization and turned from sin and self-righteousness and your works righteousness and fled to Jesus Christ who lived a righteous life, died a substitutionary death, and rose again. So that if you will repent and trust His finished work, He will forgive you of... Of what, folks? All sin. He will give you the righteousness of God in which you stand perfect and complete and acceptable to a holy God. 
He will adopt you into his family. He'll make you a child of God. And I can't wait to get to it next week. He will make you an heir of God and a joint heir of Christ Jesus. But that's only found at Zion. It's not found in, 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 in Sinai. Folks, I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know what your needs are. I hope if you're here today and you're trusting your works, I hope your heart trembles. Because you cannot endure the commandments of God. And I hope that sound of that trumpet and that voice of God ringing in your ears causes fear and trembling that will cause you to run to Jesus Christ and call on the Lord Jesus Christ that you may be saved. And if you're here as a believer, I hope that message thrills your heart to know you have not come to the mountain that can be touched, but you've come to Mount Zion where there's the promise of life in Christ. Amen? Father, help us in these moments. Lord, again, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, do a work in our hearts and lives as we see your word, as we consider it together. We pray and ask, oh Lord, that you would convict and work if there's anyone here today who has never repented and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would bring them to faith today. Lord, I thank you that in Christ, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But Father, if we continue to try to earn our way there, we trample under feet the blood of Christ and count it a common thing. Father, show us our need of grace. Show us your immense love. And Lord, may you be glorified. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If there's a need on your heart, 